I don't think our speaker needs much of an introduction. Um, Tom Sinclair has been uh, very active in the Alberta scene for many, many years. And uh, today's topic he is going to be addressing is a very interesting one. And I want him to begin his presentation by just briefly telling us why he chose the title he chose for his presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Sinclair. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Now, before I get started, though, I want to acknowledge somebody here in the crowd who has served this province and this country very well his entire life. It's Mr. Ray Speaker. Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker was the MLA for, uh, I forget the writing, but he's an MLA in Edmonton for a long time, and he served as a member of parliament as well. So when we talk about a politician, as I was introduced, we all get an image of what that means or what that is. I think sometimes when I see somebody walking down the street, we can say, ah, that's my doctor, or that's my teacher. They or he or she served me well. Mr. Speaker is a politician that you can say that anytime you see him walking down the street. He was a politician and he served us all very well. <laughs> Now, what am I doing here? And what can I say to you that hasn't already been said? And what about this title here that I'm asked about by the moderator? I've been working on this project for four years, doing the research, and the story I'm going to relate to you today is a result of that. It's a result of that research and also of my 20, first 23 years living with this gentleman you see on the screen. And those were the last 23 years of his life. So there is some background to the story. As well as that, I have his book here in my hand, which I've read several times. It's called My People, the Bloods. It's by Mike Mountain Horse. Also, I have done a lot of research and found more than 57 articles about this gentleman, from Montreal to Vancouver to Salt Lake City, Los Angeles, Miami, Denver, and all these places in between. This was a man of considerable accomplishment and achievement, and one for which we can all be very proud, as am I. Now, I never thought much of this man for many years, other than the fact that he was just my grandfather. And we have all had grandparents that we think about over time. But and we have those thoughts, those images, and those memories of them. And for me, he was just my grandfather. But then something happened to me later in my life that changed my idea of who he was and what he had done for all of us who are sitting here today. I grew up in Lethbridge. But after leaving Lethbridge, I sought work elsewhere. And over that time, I did 19 different projects in 12 different countries. And one of those last countries was uh, Ukraine. And we all know what's going on there now. But in Ukraine, Ukraine there we are. This, in Ukraine, the middle of Ukraine, is this giant statue. This statue is higher than the post office building downtown. You can just imagine how awe-inspiring that is. When I first discovered this, I sat there for two hours just looking at it and thinking about the suffering and sacrifice that the people have made and led them to put this monument up, this statue up for the people, for the people who have served them during the war. And I started to think about who did I know that served in the wars? And I thought, first of all, my father, of course, then, then, then my father-in-law, my aunts and uncles, and they all came to my mind first. And then as I paused to think about this more, I thought, you know, there's somebody else I knew who fought in that war. And that was my grandfather. 
Mike Mountainhouse. And up until that point, I'd only thought of about him as my grandfather. But here he was, a man who served his country. He was wounded four times in that war, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it as we go on, but that's the story I would like to relate to you today. And sitting there looking at this thing, thinking about what we Canadians had done or not done, how fortunate we were to live in this country where we never had this destruction, devastation that they had in Europe. We didn't have the sacrifices. Then I thought about it even more. We Canadians had a great deal to do with those two wars. We did not have it here in our own country, but we had Canadians from every town and city, from one coast to the other, who served in those wars. As a matter of fact, more than 1.675 million Canadians served in those wars. And of that 1.6 million people, over 120,000 people never came back. They are buried in Europe. And that's the sacrifice they made on our behalf and how they served us and for which we must be eternally grateful. This monument is at Vimy Ridge where Mike Mountain Horse fought. It is just as tall as that one I showed you in uh, Kiev. It's taller too, again, than the post office downtown. Mike Mountain Horse story for me begins at this mountain. You see this mountain every day when you get up and look to the west and you're nodding over here because you know the mountain. It's Chief Mountain. I know it as Old Chief Mountain. I don't know which one it is, Chief Mountain or Old Chief Mountain, but I always call it Old Chief Mountain. Mike Mountain Horse was born here in front of this mountain, somewhere near the turn of the 19th century, the end of that century. Nobody knows exactly when because nobody kept any records. The only record of his birth date is that of the military. When he signed up, the recruiting officer had to know how old he was. And looking at him, he said, well, close enough for Indian work, and that was it. Now, after being born there and growing up there, Mike Mountain Horse went to the school. This is St. Paul's Anglican School. And it's only about 10 kilometers away from where I saw, showed you where he was born. Mike was in the first class to go into that school. There were six boys that went into that school, and they were the first in that huge building. Now, if, you, if there are any teachers here among us, or former teachers among us, you would start wondering, how in the world would a teacher keep track of six little boys in this big school? Who knows where they would be and how, what would they do? But Mike went there, and I don't know how long he was there, but later in later years, they had an, uh, an alumni association for that school. And he was elected the first president of the alumni association. And I told you that some of the research I'd done for this story about Mike is his book here, My, My People of Bloods. And he talks about his experience there. And it's contrary to what we usually think about, but he says that when he's going to talk about in this book, he's going to talk about as accurately as possible some of the facts regarding my people without exaggeration of their virtues or glossing over their faults. That is, he was going to tell them, tell us exactly what happened and what he thought about them. Further on in the book, he talks about his experiences there. He's talking about the missionaries. The missionaries worked hard for the welfare of the Indians on all the reserves, and great changes had been wrought. He is giving them credit. And he goes on to say, because of them, we no longer think of the time when the buffalo will come back or the time when the white people will disappear from North America. He was a realist. He understand that things changed and that they had to change with them as well. After his uh, residential school, uh, he went to the Calgary Industrial School, where he was on the soccer team, and he's the captain of the soccer team, exhibiting his leadership qualities. At the same time he was there, this gentleman who circled 
was there as well. His name is James Gladstone. Later on, he became Senator James Gladstone. And if we have any wealthy people in this audience, you might have a $10 bill in your pocket <laughs> that has his picture on it. Mike Mountain Horse was an athlete. He liked to run. This is a picture of him before he ran a race against a gentleman named Lou Marsh, who was an international marathoner. You want another Next picture? picture? No, you saw the other picture. Oh, you want another one now? Okay. <laughs> Mike was matched up against a world-class marathoner, the American champion marathoner, to run a race here in Lethbridge. I have no idea why he was. I doubt that he even had running shoes or anything like that. I'm sure he didn't have a coach, and he knew nothing about training or nutrition or things like that. But for the first 10 miles of that marathon, he led the world champion in that foot race. And it wasn't until the 10th mile that he, in my estimation, ran out of gas. He did not know how to pace himself. And at that time, the American champion passed him. But nevertheless, Mike Mountain Horse hung in there. The articles I saw about him running this race, one headline said, the crowd lustily cheered the Indian. Now, regardless of what we think of that term today, I'm sure that Mike got inspiration from that. And he trailed that marathon runner all the way to the end. And he did finish second, only a sixth of a mile behind him. Three weeks earlier, that marathoner had run the American Championship race, and his closest competitor was two miles behind him. Mike stuck with him all the way. If you don't mind. This is a uh, photo of Mike's mother, and that's the Reverend Samuel Middleton behind him. Mike's brother was one of the first in Alberta to volunteer for the Canadian Expeditionary Force in the First World War. Unfortunately, his brother was also one of the first victims in that war. During that war, they had to be careful about not only bullets and artillery shells, but gas. The enemy had gas, which was heavier in air. They pushed it over their trenches and had fans that blew it over to Mike's trenches and then it went down into his trench. His brother was gassed three times before the Canadian military said, well, we don't think this guy is very good anymore for service and they sent him back home, which made his tribe very happy because they were celebrating to have a warrior come back. Unfortunately, he made it back only to Fort or to Montreal, where he succumbed to his disabilities from being gassed. His tribe, of course, was devastated, but the people in Fort McLeod who knew him and knew his story about going to serve planned a big funeral for him. It was so big and so many were expected, they had to issue tickets for people to come to a funeral. Now, I should be so lucky if anyone shows up for my funeral. <laughs> now, this is Mike's mother and the deceased brother's mother. She was at that funeral, and after the funeral, she and her husband or partner in the front of a one-horse buckboard had Mike and his brother Joe and Albert in the coffin in this one-horse buckboard in the middle of winter, driving from or riding from Fort McLeod to Kainai for the burial. The mother had a great deal of passion about the death of her son, as any mother would, but she blamed this Reverend Samuel Middleton for his son going, her son going off to war. Because prior to that First World War, he would always preach about being pacifist and being nice to people and don't shoot people and stuff like that. Suddenly the war came 
And this Middleton, Reverend Middleton is saying, uh, for king and country, it's your duty to go and serve in this war. And her son answered that call for king and country and came back in a coffin. His mother wanted revenge. For two weeks, she stalked the reverend with a hunting knife for two weeks. And she was about to succeed while the reverend was giving a sermon. And she came in from the back with his hunting knife, approaching him in the back, and she was going to get her revenge. But Mike Mountain Horse was there, fortunately for the good reverend, who came in and stopped her from doing that. And that was the first life he ever saved in his life, I guess, serving and saving the reverend there. Uh, six months later, that same buckboard that they had used to take his brother back to reserve for burial was being used to take Mike Mountain Horse to enlist in Fort McLeod. At that time, the early start of this First World War, it wasn't very mechanized. Uh, they still relied a great deal on horses. So when they were recruiting, the Canadian Army was recruiting, they wanted to get people who could ride horses and who could shoot. So they thought about cowboys and Indians. And where in Canada do you find cowboys and Indians? In southern Alberta. So that's where they came and they recruited Mike Mountain Horse. Cowboys because they could ride horses and Indians because presumably they could shoot. They became known as the Cowboys and Indians Brigade, famous throughout the Army from southern Alberta. Now this Mike Monhorse, as a young man, grew up just west of here. And even today, when you get up and look over to the mountains, there's nothing between here and there. It's just a vast prairie. We know we had settled here and there, but it's nothing compared to the culture shock Mike Monhorse got when he enlisted. His first shock was his train. This train here, this boxcar, originated in Vancouver. And it went from there across Canada, picking up the recruits. And you can see how crowded it is there. Now, Mike Mountain Horse, all his life, the biggest crowd he'd ever seen was in a teepee. <laughs> 10 people at the most. Now he's stuck in a boxcar like this. Culture shock. If you think we go through culture shock, what did this young boy go through? Once he got to Montreal, they put him on a ship, this ship. This is called the Ascania. It's a Greek ship, and it regularly ran between Montreal and Liverpool. And during the war, it was transport, uh, transformed into troop transport. Now, in researching this ship, I found that they had space for 1,500 soldiers below deck in third class. And we're talking about Mike Mountain Horse, who had been in a huge crowd in a teepee of 10 people, maybe, now being stuck in there with 1,500 other guys. How could he get through that? <coughs> Besides, when he'd gone up on deck, he looked out and saw nothing but water. And the most water he'd ever seen in his life was Waterton Lake, which he could swim across. He wasn't going to swim across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, he had the fear of, and the claustrophobia of being on that ship, but then he was further terrorized because they were attacked by a submarine. And the only reason they escaped that submarine was because it had a speed of 23 knots compared to the submarine's speed of only four knots. They just outran it. That submarine, on the other hand, had better luck when it came. the ship came back the other way empty. And this ship here, was sunk just off the course, uh, off the coast of uh, Newfoundland. Well, as if, as if the crowd wasn't big enough on that ship. When he got off, this is London in 1914. Can you imagine this kid getting off that boat, that boxcar, and walking down the street of London and seeing nothing but people? Culture shock, huh? incredible. But that was nothing really compared to what happened next. From London, they put him onto a ship, overseas to Europe. And the first thing they did was march him up 
to Vimy Ridge. And Mike Mountain Horse was one of those soldiers at Vimy Ridge. Prior to that, Vimy Ridge had been attacked by both the British and the French, and the British and French together. And neither of those armies had been successful. So they finally gave up and said, oh hell, let's give it to the Canadians. It was the first time the Canadians had ever fought as an army in the war. They had four divisions there. Mike was the fourth one. And they took Vimy Ridge. That is what many historians call the birth time of Canada. The patriotism and the heroism there. There were 10,000 Canadian soldiers lost in that battle, but they took the ridge. Mike Mountain Horse kept track of his battles there. Like what many soldiers do, they write letters that are compiled into records. They wrote diaries. It was Mike's method of writing this calf rope. He called it his story rope, which he went over with me many times, and he would actually put it over his shoulder while he's talking to me. There are three stories on here that I remember quite clearly, and the first one is that top one right there. In that top one, uh, he and his comrades have just captured a German trench. And he called down to the Germans to surrender. And you can see that the soldiers down there did that, holding up their hands. However, the officer who was falling down there wasn't going to do that and started shooting at Mike. So Mike did what comes naturally for people in war. He shot the officer. The other one I like to think about is this one right down here. Whoops, sorry. Holy mackerel, are we going the right way? Yeah, you're doing it. Okay. This guy, this one here. Again, his comrades have captured, no, this is where they've captured a trench, and he, gone, he had gone down in a trench, and he had over, he'd out distanced his artillery covered. And once he got there, one of his own Canadian artillery shells landed there and buried him in that trench. He was buried there for four days. And he took great, great glee in telling me the story about while he's laying there buried with debris over him, the German soldiers who had come back and recaptured the place were now sitting on them eating their rations. <laughs> he liked telling that story. And the other story I like is this one down who did that? Who, who's going to take the responsibility for that? Who's the technician over there? Come on, can you? All right, we'll start all over. Do you want me to start all over again? No, no. <laughs> Fine. Fine, okay. Okay, here we are. The story down at the bottom. Uh, Good God. You're pushing too hard. Come on, Canute. You're pushing too hard. Pushing too hard, am I? Well. Holy macaroni. Well, anyway, when I came here to start, I would prepared a one and a half hour presentation. <laughs> and then when I told I walked through that door, they said, well, you got 30 minutes, man. So really, I don't know what I'm talking about because somehow between the time coming in there and the time getting here, I had to figure out what I was going to talk about. <laughs> so thank you very much. I will try your technique. Yeah, well, I, I had advanced training on this. He said, Tom, all you have to do is do this. There. Yeah. What I want to do is get back to the, that, uh, the rope. But anyway, well, maybe we'll go on and pick it up from there to here. Uh, Mike Mountain Horse, after his service, or during his service, the general in charge of all the Allied troops was Colonel Bing. And he had said to General Curry, the guy who was in charge of the Canadian colonials, I'm hearing so much about these Indian fellows, so would you bring one of them to our next meeting? What he was hearing about was the raiding parties that the Canadians sent to scout out, out the German defenses. 
They sent 60 of these raiding parties. Of, uh, on three of them, Mike was on them. And he and his Indian comrades would strip down, crawl into the trenches, and scalp the enemies. The enemy soldiers were terrified of these Indians crawling, crawling in their trenches at night and doing this. And that's why the Canadians, one of the reasons Canadians became the first, most feared people of the Germans in that war. So General Curry did take Mike Mountain Horse to meet General Bing. And General Bing had a uh, 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 good conduct medal in his pocket to give to Mike Mountain Horse. Mike Mountain Horse, being a quick study, marched proudly up to get this, this medal, came to the general, gave and held the proper salute. General Bing, in trying to be friendly and colloquial, forgot about formal procedures, and he said to Mike, hey, Mike, how you doing? <laughs> now, Mike knew that wasn't the usual protocol for a presentation of a medal. And he felt it was very disrespectful. So he immediately dropped his salute, turned around, and sauntered away. Yes, sauntered away. General Bing turned to General Curry, handed him the message and the medal and said, give it to the fellow at a more agreeable time. <laughs> well, that went into General Curry's pocket and went into many more pockets over time before it finally got to Mike. It was handed to him, and the guy who was handing it to him at the same time said, oh, by the way, you're now an acting sergeant. So, now when Mike uh, left the military, uh, he served as a leader in Lethbridge. This here is a picture, the top picture is of a Mike when he formed what was called the All Indian Legion in Alberta. It was the first charter for a legion in Canada for Indian people. And uh, he was elected as first president. Now what really stands out in my mind about what Mike did, and I've left out half an hour according to your instructions, I've jumped to this point here, was Mike Mountainhorse <clears throat> was also the president of the Lethbridge Railway Union. Now I'm going to pause and think, let's think about that. Here we have an indigenous gentleman across the river over here who had been an elected minor chief. And now he was elected a president of a railway labor union. I doubt that there is anywhere else in the world where you have such a unique achievement where an indigenous person has succeeded in their own society and then succeeded in his new society as society as well. I held Mike in the greatest regard for that, more so than any medals or any battles he fought. Now after he was elected president of the labor union, his co-workers took him across the street to a small bar to have a celebratory beer. When they got across the street from the railway station to this bar, there were, they were met with this sign that said, no beer sold to Indians. And to emphasize the no, the letter O is in italics. Well, he wasn't gonna let him in there. But his comrades or his co workers said, we're not going in there, Mike's not going in there. So because the bartender depended on their business so often, he said, okay, he can come in. But he has to sit over there in the corner by himself with nothing on his table. Now, Mike would tell me this story many, many, many times. And in later life, I've thought back on the story because I always remembered it, because it was probably the biggest guideline I've ever had in my life. But he would tell me about these other patrons in the bar who were sitting there, pointing at him like this, saying, look, look, look at that dirty old Indian. 
And then he would sit back and he would roar with laughter. And then he'd say it again, look, look, look at that dirty old Indian. And the reason he would laugh was because, one, he was dirty, he worked in the roundhouse with coal, two, he was old, and three, he was an Indian. <laughs> so he would laugh at these guys who were laughing at him. <laughs> you know, he was proud to be an Indian. He's proud of what he'd done. He's proud to be whatever he was. And there's nothing more that any of us can ask of ourselves than what he did. He is a reason to be proud of Mike Mountainhorse. Mike Mountainhorse became famous across North America. I mentioned all these newspaper paper stories, and here's some of the examples of some of the places that wrote about him. The Lethbridge Herald itself wrote this about him. One of the most popular figures in Lethbridge during the 1930s. Now, this is the Lethbridge Herald, the paper that all of us see every day here, telling a story about a Kainai on the other side of the river who was one of the most popular figures in Lethbridge during the 1930s. Can we say something like that about anybody today in Lethbridge? I don't think so. The city also honored Mike Mountainhorse by naming a school after him. This is on the west side of the river, Mike Mountainhorse Elementary School. I was over there a couple of days, and just incidentally, you know, when you talk about stuff, you should know what you're talking about. I walked in there, and right there in the main hall is a big framed picture of an Indian. And below it says Mike Mountainhorse. And I looked at it, and I said to the principal, I'm sorry, but I don't know who that Indian is. The picture is not of Mike Mountainhorse. <laughs> I don't know how long that school has been there, but I know Mike Mountainhorse. I lived with him for 23 years. The first 23 years of my life and the last 23 years of his life. Well, today that picture isn't there, gratefully. The Calgary Military Museum honors Mike, Mike Mountain Horse. In 1917, I don't mind this man getting up and going out. When I start, I start to worry when people walk towards me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> the Calgary Military Museum honored Mike Mountain Horse in 2017. It was the 100th anniversary of the, Vimy, of the Battle of Vimy. And this uh, scroll or, uh, is, is out in the front hall here. It talks about Mike Mountain Horse as well as his headdress. His headdress was there as well. I also have his uh, battle flute that goes with his headdress. But they talk about him fighting at the Battle of Bimmy Ridge, Hill 70, Cambrai, and Amiens. Four of the major battles Canada was involved in. Mike Mountain Horse from across the river was there fighting for you and I. He goes on to tell a story about when he was buried. He's buried for four long days. And can you imagine how long those days were being buried and having the enemy soldiers sitting on you? Uh, and finally, the military, this thing says the military museum said that Mike Mountain Horse was demobilized as an acting sergeant and was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal. When I first started researching this, I thought, Distinguished Conduct Medal. Now, what does that mean? That probably means he's on time for duty or he made his bed or something like that. But in further research, the Distinguished Conduct Medal is the second highest medal for valor that a Canadian soldier can get. The last time I saw Mike was in this building. This is the Indian Hospital at Cardston. Across the street, uh, or in this Indian Hospital, on this top floor, the second window from the end, 
Mike's bed was pushed up against the window so he could look out and see. Now that I can see the sun rise and the blue sky and clouds going by, but he could see just across the street the non-Indian hospital. On this side of the street is the Indian hospital. On this side is the non-Indian hospital. If we talk about segregation and discrimination today, Mike faced all of these kinds of discrimination his entire life. And here he was on his deathbed, again facing the same discrimination. Across the street, if you're not an Indian, you can go, but Indians go in this hospital. His bed was pushed up against that window so he could see all this. I talked to him for a couple hours there. He told me more stories, and some of them, most of them, if not all of them, he told me all before, several times. Now he's reminiscing about his name. His first name wasn't Mike Mountainhorse. It was Captured Three Guns. And then it became Mike Deerfoot. And then it became something like uh, Eagle Flying Crow Flag. And now he told me his last, last name was this. He said, my people. My people now call me Mike Crossing Many Rivers. And what they were doing was honoring all the travels that he had made throughout his life, all the accolades he got in Lethbridge, in Calgary, in Alberta, across Canada and across the United States. Mike Mountain Horse was so well known, he was invited to speak at Yale University, one of the most prestigious universities in the world. When I left Mike, I walked down the hall, not very far, but I could feel his eyes on me. He was sitting on his bed with his legs hanging over and his, <clears throat> pardon me, his dark skin accentuated by his white hospital robe. I could feel him looking at me, so I stopped and I turned and I looked back at him. And he seemed to have a glow about him. Certainly on his face he had a smile as if he had just told me the dirty old Indian story once again. Two weeks later, am I using the wrong finger here? <laughs> Two weeks later, I was at his burial. This is where he is buried. It's in the northeast corner of the cemetery at St. Paul's Residential School. Now, he was buried there in 1964, and I was there. It was a the cold winter day. There was less than 20 people there. When his partner, Mary Mountain Horse, was buried, they had a service just at the corner over at the Anglican Church. There were two wagons out front. The church was packed, and they had two reverends officiating at the time. They had 12 pallbearers, six of whom were honorary pallbearers, one of them who has a block downtown here named at Parglin Building. He was one of her honorary pallbearers. Now, I know Mary Mountain, or she's a quiet, private person. And I know that all those people there were for, there for Mike Mountain, or they were there to honor him. At this Mike's funeral, however, there was less than 20 people there. And I don't know who was officiating, if anyone was, because it was cold and I wasn't paying any attention. Because I was looking across the prairie there at Old Chief Mountain. And you can just see it faintly there, the square outline of Old Chief Mountain. And I thought to myself about Mike Mountain Horse and his life and all that he had accomplished and achieved and had been recognized for. And I thought, about what he had meant to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. I thought about Mike Mountain Horse and what he had meant to me. And looking at Old Chief Mountain there, I thought, I hope 
that someday I can be like Mount, Mike Mountain Horse. That's where his story began, at Old Chief Mountain, and that's where it ended. Now, Mike Mountain Horse isn't there anymore, but his spirit is still there. And his spirit inspired me to write a poem. In 1994, when I was at that monument in Ukraine, thinking about <clears throat> the sacrifice and the suffering that people before had made for the Ukrainians and what people here had done for us. It inspired me to write these words. Embrace this Canadian home. Take it to your heart. It's your home. <laughs> Which finger am I supposed to be using here, Canute? <laughs> Embrace this Canadian home. It's your home. It's my home. It's our home. It's a home rich with magnificent mountains. Wild horses. Hunting hawks. As our home, it represents our values. Tolerance and respect. Rights and responsibilities. We share these riches and values, and then we leave a little of ourselves, just as others before did for us. So embrace this Canadian home, take it to your heart, and it will make your heart strong like a mountain, spirited like a horse, and sore like a hawk. Thank you for sharing this moment with me. But I've got this sign over here. <laughs> Pretty hard to follow that. Uh, we also want to thank LSCO for providing this facility free of charge. Can't beat that. Uh, we also want to thank the University of Lethbridge for their support. Thanks to Shaw TV for recording our sessions. And you can watch SACPAW on Shaw Spotlight TV or on SACPAW.ca or on YouTube. And we also want to thank the Lethbridge Herald for their um, coverage. Uh, next week's topic is, uh, speaker will be Bryson Brown, who's going to talk about the history of vaccinations. A contentious topic in this part of the world. I would also like to bring your attention to a special SACPA event, uh, a panel discussion on addiction issues and best practices, which will take place at the downtown library at uh, six, uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. And what is the date on that, Bev? Monday. Monday, okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we have a few minutes for questions. And uh, so remember the coaching here. Comments short, question to the point. So <laughs> at the discretion of the speaker. Okay, anybody? Don't tell me he covered it so well. You have all these questions. I have a question. <laughs> well, we'll let, we'll let Knud ask a question, then you can answer and then follow up. Okay. My name is uh, Knud Peterson. Thank you very much, Tom, for coming back to Lethbridge as often as you do. Uh, I know you well from the Lethbridge Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, you were fantastic athletes back in the days, and you probably still are, but. Uh, my question relates a little bit to how is your, your family ties to Mike Mountain Horse? How, how it, did you end up being, how did he end up being your grandfather?
Why don't you just say, who's your dad, man? <laughs> okay, how many of you guys here know who your dad was? <laughs> uh, how did that happen? Well, Mike Mountain Horse, my bloodline is with his partner, Mary Mountain Horse, who was uh, the daughter of Joe Healy, who was uh, one of the minor chiefs who chased her heritage all the way back to Custer's Last Stand. So Mike Mountain Horse married her, but I don't care what the bloodline was, he was my grandfather, and I was proud of him. I'm proud of his heritage, I'm proud of what he did, and the only thing I can ever say again is, I hope I can be a Mike Mountain Horse. <laughs> Terry Shellington, <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. In a way, it was complete and it needs no questions. <clears throat> but as a curious person, I'm trying to picture this story you referred to twice of, of being buried for four days. I'm trying to picture uh, some of the details of that and people sitting on top of me and so on. Can you, can you say a little bit more about how that happened? Mike Mountain Horse, from what I can understand, was a very aggressive warrior. And that's what he considered himself to be a warrior. And he felt by being in the war, he was carrying on the warrior tradition of his people. And one thing he wanted to make sure of was that he did not let them down. He wanted to be known as a warrior. And so that battle scene you see of him there, he had led a machine gun section uh, behind enemy lines, uh, which is very difficult to do in those days. And in doing that, uh, he was ahead of his artillery, of course, which exploded and buried him. Now, I don't know much about the details, but what I do know is how he would laugh about being buried. Uh, how he, he didn't get into details, I was just a kid. So he, what he wanted to do is just tell me, oh, my, man, I was buried. That's, a bit, you know, that's enough for me. <laughs> One of the other stories, like, to illustrate that point, I used to, uh, when I was a little kid, preschool kid, I used to walk across the prairie to meet him on his way home from work at half, halfway. And I was scared of rattlesnakes. And he said, well, here's what you do. You just get some prairie grass, chew it up, and then rub it over your hands and there, there you can go pet a rattlesnake. Uh, my good fortune was that I never met a rattlesnake that I knew. <laughs> so the details about him being buried, sir, uh, I do not know him, but I can vivid, uh, in my own mind, I can imagine what it would be like. You know, you got boards and the debris from the uh, short wood shoring up the sides of this thing. And he must have been mostly buried if not entirely, but I can't, could never imagine how this man would breathe buried for four days. And what would he do if he had to go to the bathroom? Good God. So who knows? I don't know the details. I just know that he was buried. And I have no doubt about it because it's in the military records. I have a question. There's been, uh, there hasn't been a lot of recognition historically in Canada about the service of our Aboriginal folks in the military and in, the, in, in the, our wars. And I also understand many of them had problems even getting pensions and recognition for that. Do you want to comment on some of that? Discrimination in Mike's era was wrong, and it is wrong today. When a Native person came home, from war, they did not get the same pensions that a non-Native person did. Now, why, I don't know. You've heard the story of Mike Mountain Horse. I can rationalize it somehow from a government point of view, but there is no justification for something like that. I know there was a problem with it. I know that people tried to do something about it. There's all kinds of problems like that. Another problem like that is something like the uh, lack of, a, lack of a acknowledgement that female Indians had. They were treated differently than male in, Indians. 
It goes on and on and on. And I'm just going to just take a moment here to, to talk about the title of this thing. The title of my presentation is The Dirty Old Indian, in quotation marks, because it's Mike's words, The Dirty Old Indian, a Canadian hero. When I first started doing this, and when people asked me what the title was, I said, The Dirty Old Indian, a Canadian hero. Well, immediately, it was silence and looking away. How can you say that? I'm producing a play, and the produ play director, uh, non-Indian, the first thing he says to me, you're not actually going to say that, are you? You're not actually going to say that. And the guy next to me, a national indigenous leader, said, it's about time somebody said it. It's about time somebody said it. If we do not talk about these things now, today, while we have the chance, we are going to be talking about them again in a hundred years. Because the first thing that we need to do to implement change in terms of these attitudes is to talk about the problem. Let's recognize it, let's deal with it, and let's move on. Very good presentation. My name is Mike McKegg. Um, I was in the RCMP a lot of years. Part of it was in Carson. I was really interested to hear your, your comments about the Indian Legion, because I had some terrible experiences with legions not allowing war veterans to even come in. Can you tell us a little bit more about that legion and what happened to it? Uh, Mike, I wish I knew, but I, I do not know. I just know that uh, Mike Mountain has a, had a great deal of difficulty in getting a charter from the Canadian Legion for an all-Indian Legion. And uh, I know he organized it. I know he's elected the first president. And that was all I could ever find out about that, Mike. So I do not know. But let me say something about that personally. An all-Indian legion might sound special that we're recognizing the Indians. But I don't think an Indian or a tall Indian or white Indian or a yellow Indian or a green Indian should be acknowledged as heroes for this country. I think that everybody who served was a hero. And they should be recognized as such. And we do not need a, a, a legion for Indians. We do not need, and I'm going to, this will be heresy, I'm sure. I do not believe in the Indigenous Veterans Day. I believe that Indians deserve the same amount of respect as anyone else. And that should be on November 11th, Veterans Day. Thanks for the question, Mike. Uh, last takeaway message you would like us to have. Okay. The last takeaway message I've been able to, I don't know if I have a message here at all. And the only message I could take is Mike's, that be proud of yourself and what you have done for your fellow citizens. And in that case, you do that, you will all end up being a hero. My last words on this presentation is the title. I didn't finish what I was saying earlier in that the title comes from Mike's own words himself. Uh, look, look, look at that dirty old Indian. And the men, you know, dirty, dirty old Indian they're pointing at is a national hero, a decorated national hero. And let's recognize him for that. Uh, if nothing else, this title, the dirty old Indian, my Canadian hero, if nobody knows anything about it, it is going to be provocative. And that is good, because it's about time we talked about this. Uh, let me thank you just while well, I've got this opportunity. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for SACPA for having me here. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for enduring me for this time. <laughs> Thank you so much.
Thank you. So we thank you very much. Standing ovation. And it was very well done.